it's time for teamwork now. I think that most of the panelists, they have everybody as the video. Theo is here, Peter, Julia, Mathieu. Nobody is missing, everybody's here, so we can begin. Um, just to let, let me introduce you uh, to our speakers. Um, Julia Carbone, Deputy Director of the Business and Biodiversity Program at the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Theo Curin is a former Paralympic athlete. Mathieu Wittwert is a young, inspiring leader. Peter Fischer, Policy Officer, Green Sport Experts Group Coordinator at the European Commission. Uh, you are morning. all here, guys. Good morning. Um, morning. We will begin by a short intro intro introduction made by yourself. I think it's the, it's the easiest way if you can present yourself. Julia, if we can begin with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here and uh, to, you know, being this first panel following the presentation of Madame la Ministre. Um, I work for IUCN, which is like a membership organization, the largest conservation or, you know, membership organization focusing on conservation of nature. Um, we have a very strong program working on sports and biodiversity. And this is the reason why I'm here today. We have started working on this topic following um, an, a conversation and discussions with the International Olympic Committee. And since then, we actually have been in a in a partnership with IUC. And uh, the first thing we did was to try to identify what does it mean? What is the connection between sports and uh, biodiversity? And this took you know, three, four years to collect data, information, guidelines. And, um, and in the next, you know, we are getting really excited, getting ready for a new engagement with IUC, working on the implementation, working with federations and working with Olympic cities. Um, and I think the, the key was at the beginning, there were a lot of questions like, what's the link? You know, why are we talking about biodiversity and sports? You know, is that relevant? Is that topical? And um, it is often the case, things become relevant and, and topical when there is a, um, a crisis. There have been few crises, few pushbacks from especially civil society on a number of large events. Uh, and then that's when I think more generally people understood, yes, there is a very strong link, not always positive, um, but it could be much more positive and we can turn it around and avoid all the potential you know, negative aspects and really make it a synergic relationship. Um, so I'm here, you know, just to give my ideas, suggestions on this on this topic, and you know, certainly the the opening by Madame la Ministre is really a, a great um, opening, you know, because it really talks about opportunities, how to strengthen the relationship between ecology and sports, even at the political level, which is critical because these the decision makers are really the ones that define you know, the, a lot of decisions in, in a lot of sectors, including sports. Um, so I'll, I think this, this is enough for us, as sufficient as an introduction, and then I'm happy to participate in this, uh, you know, first uh, panel. Let's move to you, Theo. Theo, I don't know if you want to speak French or English, feel free to speak the language you want. Français, si ça, Alors, si je, voulais, je vous laisse vous présenter. <coughs> Alors bonjour à tous, merci en tout cas pour, pour cette invitation, je suis vraiment très très heureux d'être parmi vous, c'est juste incroyable, donc un grand merci. Euh, alors pour me, me présenter assez brièvement, moi je m'appelle Théo Curin, j'ai 21 ans, je pense être le plus jeune aujourd'hui, je ne sais pas, euh, je ne sais pas s'il y, y a des gens aussi jeunes que moi, mais en tout cas c'est un honneur. Euh, alors pour la faire courte, moi je suis tombé malade à l'âge de 6 ans suite à une méningite bactérienne, ce qui a provoqué ensuite l'amputation de mes quatre membres. Euh, et durant la rééducation, j'ai découvert quelque chose d'incroyable. J'ai découvert l'eau, la natation, que ce soit à la piscine ou dans l'océan. J'ai découvert cet élément qui me faisait peur dans un premier temps et ensuite un élément qui a totalement changé ma vie. 
parce qu'aujourd'hui, quand je vais dans une piscine ou quand je vais me baigner dans, dans, dans l'océan, ben, je n'ai plus de prothèse, je n'ai plus de fauteuil. Et euh, c'est un sentiment de liberté, de légèreté que je n'ai pas au quotidien. Et je trouve ça vraiment euh, incroyable. Et euh, donc, euh, j'ai commencé la natation paralympique très tôt, assez jeune, euh, quand j'avais à peu près 8-9 ans. À l'âge de 13 ans, j'ai même commencé le, le haut niveau parce que je m'entraînais deux fois par jour. Et j'ai eu la chance de, de faire des compétitions internationales comme les Jeux Paralympiques de Rio euh, en 2016, en étant le plus jeune de la délégation française. J'ai fait d'autres compétitions aussi comme les Championnats d'Europe, les Championnats du Monde. Et euh, alors, il faut savoir que dans le paralympisme, on est classé par catégorie de, de handicap. Et ce n'est pas toujours hyper juste. Pour vous donner une idée, par exemple, ça faisait deux ans que je nageais contre des mecs qui avaient leurs deux mains. Donc, forcément, ils étaient très avantagés par rapport à moi. Donc, j'ai décidé de mettre de côté euh, ma petite carrière de nageur paralympique euh, en attendant que ces problèmes de classification soient résolus. Et euh, bah, en fait, euh, plus le temps passe, plus je me rends compte que je suis attiré justement par les euh, milieux dits naturels. Euh, Madame la ministre a justement parlé de la natation en olive tout à l'heure et je trouve ce sport juste incroyable. Il n'existe pas encore euh, en paralympisme, peut-être qu'un jour ça existera, pourquoi pas, mais moi je me suis dit bah, pourquoi pas me lancer mon propre défi qui a un rapport avec l'eau mais aussi avec l'environnement. Euh, alors il faut savoir que moi l'environnement, bah, à part trier dans mon appartement, c'est tout ce que je fais, donc je n'ai pas encore suffisamment de connaissances euh, pour, pour, pour faire la morale à des gens, des, des, des choses comme ça, mais j'ai décidé de me lancer le défi de traverser le lac Titicaca entre le Pérou et la Bolivie euh, dans six mois, en novembre 2021, donc soit 122 kilomètres de, de, de traversée à la nage en totale autonomie avec deux autres personnes, Malia Metella, une ancienne nageuse olympique et Mathieu Bidwood qui est juste là dans cette table ronde avec nous. Pourquoi J'ai demandé à Mathieu déjà bah parce qu'il va se présenter hein, mais c'est un athlète incroyable qui a déjà fait des, des défis complètement fous. Et en plus, bah, c'est parce que c'est un éco-aventurier, il a des connaissances sur le côté environnemental juste incroyables. Et justement, il m'apporte des connaissances que je n'avais pas auparavant sur le côté écologie, écologie circulaire, toutes ces choses-là qui étaient pour moi bah, toutes nouvelles. Et euh, aujourd'hui, grâce à lui, grâce à, à ses connaissances, et bah, je me sens un petit peu moins bête sur ce côté-là. Et du coup, bah, je sens que j'ai un petit peu ma place aujourd'hui de parler à, avec vous tous. Et c'est vraiment un plaisir. Donc voilà, je vais partir dans moins de six mois avec Mathieu et Malia traverser le lac navigable le plus haut du monde et on a cette envie avec Mathieu et avec toute notre équipe de se lancer un défi personnel euh, sportif mais en envoyant un énorme message sur le côté euh, écologique euh, évidemment. Merci beaucoup, merci Théo. I just a uh, quick reminder, you can switch language. You have uh, at your disposal translation in French and English. So feel free to, to choose the language you want. And you obviously, as you can see, you have a translation in the sign language. Um, as Théo was talking about Mathieu, we will move to you, Mathieu. I don't know if you want to speak French or English. I can and speak I in guess... English, yeah. Okay, go on, who are you? <laughs> Thank I have a so kind of an, of an idea. <laughs> yeah, Theo made a, a, a great introduction, so so that was perfect. Uh, thank you, Theo. You should come every time. Um, that would be great. <laughs> so basically, um, I love adventures and I love to tell stories. So I use my passion for adventures to tell stories um, and to talk about the green evolution. And how I do that, I started with a dream that I had in 2017 to cycle around the world to meet local solutions against plastic waste. So I went off with my cousin and we cycled 18,000 kilometers, mostly in emerging, um, in developing countries to meet local solutions against plastic waste and share them globally um, through a web series, through medias. And it was really a sort of eye opener of the amount of solutions that exist in so many countries, um, I mean, We cycled all around East Africa. Uh, we crossed India. We crossed. Um, we went in the favela to meet the, the informal se sector of waste collection, and it was really striking to see that everywhere there was solutions. So when I came home uh, in France, where I am now, I joined a company which is called Circulaire, and now daily we connect local solutions with global companies to reduce their waste, eco-design their products. And while doing that, it was intellectually very interesting. Um, but physically not, not so much challenging. So I set up for a new challenge, which was to cross, uh, to swim across the Gibraltar Strait, to talk about the microplastic there is um, in the Mediterranean Sea, 
then next week, actually, this is very exciting because next week I'm going to, to, to swim down the River Seine to spotlight and to mimic the journey of a cigarette butt because for 32 years, the cigarette butt has been the first uh, plastic waste in the ocean. So how can we make this video uh, visual? We decided to, to swim with another uh, three swimmers um, to swim the, the journey of the cigarette butt. And on Saturday, we will try to, to get the world's biggest cleanup of cigarette butts collection in Paris. Uh, and in November, I'm going with, uh, with Theo on this great adventure on which we're doing a lot of things uh, in terms of sustainability. It's actually so much things that it's, it's even hard to communicate on, on one uh, specific, uh, specifically, but uh, I'm very, very happy to be here with you and to share uh, some of my, my thoughts and, and some of the, the issues we've, we've seen with Theo and, and challenges we face. Peter Fischer, it's your turn to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very inspiring, uh, Theo and uh, Mathieu, what, what you tell us. Um, it's, it's, it's really about meeting people like you and, and finding out uh, what, you know, how, how you can inspire others. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm in this job. So I, I work at the European Commission in the sport unit and the Director General for Education, Youth, Culture and Sport. And um, indeed, I am chairing the uh, coordinating the work of the expert group on green sport. The experts are um, sent from the member states. And uh, we also have, of course, um, representatives of the sport movement as observers. And the, the ultimate objective is to develop um, uh, recommendations for a common framework for sustainable sport. And that is the, let's say, the ultimate objective. And this is the, the, what we will be working towards. So um, I've joined the, the sport unit in, in February of this year. So I'm relatively new in the field. But I'm a, you know, I'm a passionate um, well, sport fan and also still practitioner. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, almost ashamed to say I'm a cyclist when I hear what Mathieu did, but uh, <laughs> still, I like to be outdoors. Um, I'm very conscious of um, the impact of, of waste uh, in, in outdoors. And maybe I, I can also share that I've uh, attended several world European championships in football, basketball and the Olympic Games. And I've seen also um, some progress, but still also some problems with the impact of such major events. So this, this should probably suffice for, for a first round of introduction. I'm really glad to be part of this panel and to also get to meet um, so many uh, interesting experts uh, who are at this conference. Thank you. Um, let's get straight into it. How can we achieve a greener sport, greener sports in general? Who wants to begin? Julia. Happy to look at this. Um, well, so this is really the work we have done at IUCN. Um, and it's not to under, underestimate the potential of the positive, but one of the things we said is really important to look also at the potential impacts that sport events and venues can have. So there are two aspects we looked at, the, the venue, so the buildings, the facilities, and the events. Um, like, and we treated it as every other sector. Like we work on mining, oil and gas, we look at renewable energy, and we looked at sport with exactly the same lens, saying there are a number of impacts on how sport events and sport venues can have an impact on nature. And so this is through habitat uh, loss, through pollution, through climate change, through invasive species. And we looked at how these categories, that is basically the categories of pressures that have been recognized by the you know, IBES and all the main assessments apply to sport. And they do apply, all of them. You know, we talked about pollution. So this is you know, water pollution, waste pollution. We talked about invasive species, which is a big issue for a number of sports. Not all, but a number of sports have an issue of bringing you know, invasive species to you know, different areas, especially in international events. Habitat loss is a key issue when you have large venues, for example, uh, mostly, I mean, you could have disturbance for smaller events. So we kind of really structured the analysis like this and then went down with the real 
you know, understanding of where, what could be the best practices uh, that could be implemented. So I think the overall, the message is that sports needs to be managed and need to sports, you know, the event organizers or the ve venue developers need to look at their activity just like any other, uh, you know, activity and business that have a potential impact on the environment and being very structured and scientific on the impact assessments and then the mitigation measures. Then the other side of the coin, however, is that sport, like a number of sectors, but not all, but certainly sport, has a huge dependency on nature. That means sport depends on a healthy environment because we talked about it, you know, certain sports happen directly in nature. You don't want, you know, like you don't want to swim in polluted waters. But even without talking to this, going to these extremes of being polluted environment and degraded environment, we have experienced in this past year that psychologically the benefit of being in an environment that is pristine, that there is green, that it helps also psychologically. So this dependency is actually the driver that should bring even more consciousness in addressing the impacts, but also doing positive things because sport, sport venues, but also sport events can be a real trigger for a positive contribution to nature. One of the, our latest publication was really about urban biodiversity, which is a concept that IUCN is really strongly putting forward with, you know, ECLE and a number of other city, cities networks, the importance of nature in cities. And I guess we talked about, we were talking about this years ago, and this year I think this became really important. And there we looked at how sport events and sport venues have been a trigger to bring nature in, in cities. And we realized that there are a number of really good examples, but this could be even maximized even, you know, even more if this is done early on with the planning, you know, really already in the planning phase. Um, you know, it's relevant to this conversation, given that we are also hosted, you know, by a French organization. One of the good examples that we have highlighted is Paris 2024 and their strategy, especially for the re, um, refurbishment of a whole uh, neighborhood and really using that opportunity to also think about it with nature at the center of you know, the planning. So to me, it's certainly a positive relationship. Uh, it could be even more positive, but uh, it is important not to underestimate the potential threats, especially of large venues and, and big events. But there is knowledge out there. There are a lot of good organizations. And also, also why we say as part of the solutions, there is partnerships, partnership, partnerships with you know, uh, scientific organizations, NGOs that have the knowledge, local knowledge and biodiversity is local. And there is certainly a win-win for all and potential synergies. Um, last but not least, but really talking about, you know, the work that Theo and Mathieu are doing. One of the key issues and let's say opportunities for so sports is to raise awareness first and then education of issues and about the importance of the environment. And so having, you know, events like you're saying, you know, the, the, the journey of the cigarette butt is amazing. I mean, I think it's such a genius idea. Um, in, during events, during, you know, this is also where, for example, even broadcasters can really play a, a, an important role. They're there talking, commenting about the event, and then they could spend, you know, 10 minutes saying something about the, the environment that is hosting the event, some information. This will require coordination. But I tell you, you know, people will be, people are interested. They are thirsty about good information, positive information. And I think nature is a perfect, you know, source of stories and certainly a fantastic setting for sports. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to move to you, uh, Mathieu. Maybe we're going to talk a bit more about those, those actions. Uh, if, if, I, if I was to ask you this question, how can we achieve greener sport? What would you answer? Actually, so I don't work so much in the sports industry or the sports sector, but I can yeah, but make sport it. practice for everybody. Yeah, 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 uh, definitely. But but I think the parallel which would be interesting is is to because I've been working with a lot of companies, so I think there is actually a in, very interesting parallel to how brands and companies are shifting and towards how the, the sports can also change. And and I've realized there's kind of four steps. So maybe it's synthesizing it uh, very simply. But the first one would be to measure your impact. 
because when you measure it, you can actually understand it. And that's what also, uh, Julia, you, you were saying. The second one would be to have a strong ambition. And that is something that sports people really have. Actually, it's four steps that, that athletes usually have. Uh, first, they know where they are, where they stand in terms of performance. Then they set themselves a goal, a, a strong ambition. And then the third step would be to, to get training. So when you know where you want to go, how do you get there? You actually get training on the subject. And that's actually something that Theo has been seeing um, <laughs> because he had the, the, the strong ambition of, I have this deputy TKK, but how do I get there in terms of sustainability? I need to, to, to have the knowledge. So that would be the third step. And the final one would be to actually implement those actions um, and put them in practice. So basically, I think those steps, we find them in companies that change. We find them in, in uh, sports people that have them originally and, and get all those four steps would be, I think, crucial uh, to, to achieve a greener sports in terms of industry. And in terms of athlete or adventurers, we need actually people to step up. To, we need people to speak up and we need people to embrace those issues. Uh, and to embrace those issues, they also need to get, I think, uh, that's my belief, the, the, the sense of urgency of uh, what uh, you were saying, Julia. I mean, the, the environment in which we, we do sports is evolving. And if we don't change, actually, some of the many sports are actually threatened by it. Theo, if you want to add something, you want to add something, Theo? Oui, pourquoi pas. Justement, euh, je suis vraiment d'accord avec ce que dit Mathieu, évidemment. Et même Julia, tout à l'heure, j'ai trouvé ça hyper intéressant. On est vraiment en phase sur, sur ça. Euh, pour moi, le, le, le sport, c'est un outil incroyable pour beaucoup, beaucoup de choses. Et je pense qu'on peut évidemment aussi l'utiliser pour l'écologie, l'environnement. Moi, l'exemple tout simple que je connais aujourd'hui, voilà, je suis jeune, je n'ai pas encore de connaissances dans tout, mais le handicap, je connais bien et je me rends compte petit à petit et tous les jours que grâce au sport, on change les mentalités sur la différence, sur le, le handicap. On parle de plus en plus du paralympisme. Ce n'était pas le cas il y a quelques années. L'exemple tout bête, c'est que les Jeux paralympiques, on ne le les voyait même pas à la télévision il y a encore quelques années. Aujourd'hui, on a des heures et des heures de direct pendant les Jeux et ça, c'est incroyable. Donc, je pense qu'on peut utiliser évidemment aussi le sport pour envoyer un énorme message sur le côté environnemental en faisant pourquoi pas des, des défis comme on, on le fait avec Mathieu. Mais je pense qu'il y a vraiment un enjeu à réaliser dans les fédérations chez nous ou même dans le monde entier parce que j'ai nagé pendant de nombreuses années dans des clubs, dans des... Dans des, dans, dans des académies, etc. Et c'est vrai que je pense qu'on on, on a tendance à négliger un petit peu cette partie-là. Mais, mais, mais je pense que les clubs, les académies, donc, où on regroupe beaucoup de jeunes, c'est l'endroit euh, le plus important, selon moi, pour faire passer ce, ce genre de message. Et je pense qu'on doit vraiment progresser là-dessus, d'autant plus qu'on a les, les moyens de le faire. Quoi. Donc, il ne faut vraiment pas lâcher et, et travailler, pourquoi pas, un petit peu plus dans les, dans les fédérations sur ce point de vue-là. Ouais. Peter, working at the European level, what, what can we do to achieve this so-called greener sport? Yeah, I think what, what Theo just said is, is one of the things that uh, I'm very interested in. Um, and I will not have, have the answer to your question, but I think what we really need to, to look at, uh, and I think that's, well, that's what I want to do in this expert group on green sport. It's not the first time um, the sport movement uh, looks at those issues. Um, there's already quite a, there's quite a lot of good practice out there. Um, what I've learned since I'm on this job is that um, the as in many areas in life, um, what, what is important that uh, the good practices and the know-how trickles down uh, at the local level. And this is also uh, what will make uh, the European Green Deal um, or what is important for the European Green Deal as, as it comes to the European Climate Pact, which essentially means that there has to be a buy-in from the citizens at local and, and regional level. And likewise, to implement sustainable sport practices, um, it's great if major sport organizations um, are aware they have sustainability concepts, but there's uh, hundreds of thousands of um, clubs uh, and, and of course millions of individual uh, athletes uh, and or just 
um, you know, people who like to be outdoors and, and be active. And it's important to change their um, awareness and, and ultimately also their behavior. And I, and I agree that um, there are some areas uh, which Julia alluded to where um, it's not only about promoting uh, good behavior, but it's also preventing, um, let's say, bad habits, bad production, uh, um, uh, unsustainable ways of, uh, you know, maintaining things or even producing things. So it's it's a whole range of areas that we will look at, and um, hopefully, if member states will come to an agreement, we will have uh, recommendations in eighteen months' time or or two years from now. That hopefully all, all everybody across Europe will uh, subscribe to. Um, well, who do we begin with? Because we were talking about people having a sports activity, we were talking about the professional athletes. Do do the professional athletes have to show the way, or is it the public that is going to pressure those professionals to, towards a, a greener sport? Because Julia, you, you talked about uh, from sp some sport venues. I mean, it's it's anti-ecological when you see all the cars going to those those places. When you see the the, the general waste, uh, it, it's a it's a huge problem. And what can we do against that? Do we ask the athletes to tell the people to take care of the nature? Do, do we ask the people to ask actually the the athletes? Who do we begin with? So, well, at least from IUCN perspective, we are working with the international federations and regional federations in certain instances, and with this idea that it will trickle down. The process is generally happens through yeah. the uh, selection of uh, hosts, you know, for games, and then putting these requirements in these selection processes. Um, so starting from the Olympic Games and to be, you know, the Olympic Games selection process has also changed thanks to our UCN, you know, uh, influence. We have looked at the criteria, we have put more, uh, more specific elements related to the natural component. They had already a lot of elements related to pollution, climate change, but we strengthened the natural component. But it's not just about Olympic Games, there are also international events. And then the international federations have a commitment to educate the level down. So the regional and then the regional to the national. But sports is everywhere. So as Peter said, you know, it's also about clubs, which is the ideal is that everybody in their own little size, every, every little drop will count. So it's not, and this is that the important message that I want to share is because we work with IOC and the Olympics and international federation, it doesn't mean that the others don't have a role to play. Absolutely not. It's just that sitting from where I am, I can only reach out to the, you know, for me, it's easy to reach out to the international federations and then ask them to reach out to the regional or to the national and then them to the clubs. So it has to scale down, but um, so therefore the answer is everybody. But um, in terms of processes, I think is really the whole process of organizing events, showing the positive and and then involving the athletes because athletes also is just our users of the event. So the event, the venue and the event organization can be perfect, but the users being the athletes or the fans, if they don't do the right thing, then half of the problem is still there. So it is an educational program that has to be with everybody. I mean, I worked for many years in the tour also on sustainable tourism and it's very, very similar. You know, you can have a really great program in the hotel, but if the tourists themselves don't understand and they're not aware and they don't care, a lot of the efforts that a hotel put in place are going to be wasted. So this is what makes it challenging, but also a great opportunity to really be inclusive, you know, and make it a really good, you know, opportunity for everybody to get something positive out of it, a good learning, a feel good also, because you come out and you say, I have been doing something good, not just enjoying looking at the, you know, watching my football game, but I actually did something good today. Who wants to add something? Maybe, Maybe I can. Yeah. yeah. Um, Go on, Mathieu. I, I just want to say that I completely agree because I think everyone should, we should begin by uh, everyone, but, uh, but everyone should be involved. But I think we should also begin with the people that 
um, want to be involved because there will always be people that actually um, won't agree or won't be willing to change. But we, we should start by the people who have this energy, this will to, to change and to, to speak up. Uh, and I think us as athletes or as adventurers, we have a special role to play uh, in the message. They, they can have a, um, a very big impact on people and people's mindset. And the very, I think the, the a strong opportunity with sports is that it's your emotion, it captures people's attention. And then it's, it's very easy to, to, set, to, 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 to get a message through. And the message um, should shift from uh, being the one of promoting a product to the one of promoting uh, better behavior or better uh, even questions that people can, can ask. And so I think as, as athletes and adventure, we have a role in what we say to, to, to help this, this team evolve. Um, so that's, that's where... Uh, that's also something that I, I could uh, I could add. I don't know if Theo wanted to comment, but if I may just follow up on this, because I think uh, just to follow on what, what you've just said and also what Julia alluded to, I think we need to, it's also communication exercise, of course, right? It's an education challenge. Uh, and I think we need to have, uh, I think athletes, uh, can be role models, especially if they if they are credible and if they are real. But then again, we need also we don't have to go um, necessarily to the famous stars. We we should also uh, use uh, inspiring uh, activists or adventurers like you or or inspiring um, athletes who are maybe less well known. And I think it's the it's those kind of stories that that can help um, raise awareness and hopefully lead to some some, you know, uh, better and more sustainable behavior. Yeah. I think we're gonna move to the questions from, I was about to say the questions from the floor, but no floor here. So we move to the questions from the public. Jan, you're here today to help us. Thank you. You're very so welcome. You're supposed to ask the questions. Yes, yes. Uh, well, thank, thanks for the questions. Um, we received like four questions. So also I can remind all the panelists that you can access the Q&A and you can actually answer. Uh, I've seen like a question for, for Mathieu. So maybe like you will be like, a, I don't know, the, the right person to actually answer a question about you. So I don't want to, to take the, <laughs> to be your voice. <laughs> and uh, so feel free to answer the question. You can like create discussions as well. Uh, I think that the question that we picked is uh, from e Eva Walsock. Uh, I, hope, I hope my pronunciation is not too <laughs> disastrous, but um, Eva, Eva is asking, how can we change our current um, elite sports system to be more in accord with the issues of climate change? That's tough. Yes, and, and she, <laughs> she quotes she quotes as an example that if we take football in France, the teams are actually flying from one city to the other. Oh, that's terrible. And uh, and that seems like counterintuitive nowadays. Uh, is there someone that wants to jump in? Yeah, they they fly from Paris to Lille when it's actually one hour train journey. I don't know if someone wants to <laughs> go on with that. Well, we haven't really, as I use I mean, we we. A climate change and emissions are also an impact on, on nature and uh, we haven't specifically talked about climate change but that's what I'm saying I think we need to look at sports and um, events the same way with the same critical eye we would look to a business we would you know as a society say to a business you have to cut your emissions and yeah. the first thing is avoidance Avoid, avoid, avoid. Find everything that you can do to cut down your, you know, your emissions. And for example, transport, you know, and then you look at tier one, you know, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And scope one, you know, and then you apply this scope to the type of business. And in this case, mm -hmm. we're looking at organizing an event. The the actual, you know, probably this to me would be scope two use of transport for bringing in the, and out the athletes what is the best way to avoid it? Still maintaining the quality of the event, of course. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, as you said, you know, using different kinds of transports, location of the event, and even before you even get to the discussions of offset. 
And this is where, of course, right now we are all talking about net zero. Uh, we need to get to net zero, but let's not forget that the best way to get to net zero is first avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. So treat like an event, just like a business and think about where can you avoid, where you can you know, minimize and then calculate what you have to offset. But that is really, really the last mile, the, and, you know, the residual element that you cannot avoid. Um, and I know there are a lot of good, you know, good approaches out there, guidelines, there's tons that has been done already on climate change recommendations on how to do it. Um, and even borrowing from other sectors, such as, as, you know, for example, tourism that has talked a lot about climate. So yeah, I don't see the reason why for these kind of things to still happen, honestly. And, and maybe I, I would like to add on that, that um, that's something that we had to go through with Defititikaka and Theo. Uh, we actually- Yeah, definitely. It's on the other side of the world, so. Yeah, so, so that's that's a, a big issue that we had. It's we, we can't have uh, the lake in France, so that's impossible. So we actually had to calculate every, uh, we did the carbon footprint of all the project. And it's still in the making today, so I don't have the final results, but we find out uh, now that some of, some of the results show that the plane is actually a small part of it. Uh, if we think about all the travels that we have, it's one year of preparation for just mm -hmm. uh, one week of, of swimming. So actually doing this calculation is also changing your mentality and, and knowing where the figures are and when you have, where you can actually have an impact. So for instance, that's why we decided in the building of the raft to build it only from secondhand materials. So that's also a big shift. And so when it's secondhand, we think, okay, if we can't have secondhand, can we have recycled products? Or can, can we actually borrow some items? What will be the end of life of the, the raft? So it's actually taking that philosophy of the circular economy and ingraining it in the, in the whole aspect of the project. And one thing that was of good help for us, and I think it can be a good help for other athletes, other clubs, other members, was the equal charter of uh, the Ministry of Sports and of the French Minister of Sports and, and, uh, w, w, and VVF. <laughs> um, because it, it was kind of a framework in which there is like 15 different engagements, whether it's in um, environment or other themes, social themes. And for us, we, it, it was a bit like box to tick. So do we do any action on this? Can we actually be better on this? It was sort of a grid. And this grid was well, really helpful for us, uh, even in, in the way that the things that we want to eat. I know that's a big debate we have with Theo. Um, <laughs> but I understand that. <laughs> but it's also, you know, knowing the impact that what, of, of what you do uh, can have on the environment. And, and Theo is actually, it's, it's very helpful for me because um, he's taking in a lot of things and, it, and I'm asking him to change a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> some of it he's willing to do, some of it not yet. But it's also, I think the, the right shift is you have to take people where they are at the moment and you can't have a jump uh, too big at the moment. Otherwise you will create frustration and, and it won't be positive. So I think there's a very interesting frameworks that already exists. And, um, and we have to calculate as, as you were saying, uh, Julia, everything that we do in order to, to make the change that are appropriate. Better, what kind of policies can we implement to I don't know, forbid clubs to fly for one hour train journey. Well, I, I don't, I don't think we can <laughs> yet. Um, not yet. Uh, or we will not, I think at the commission, we will not propose legislation of this sort, at least not yet. <laughs> I am not aware, but I mean, there's, there's growing pressure, of course. Um, and uh, I, I know of some some clubs in a in a country that used to be a, a member of this wonderful European Union, uh, and they uh, famous clubs who who travel uh, uh, no longer by plane uh, to to play the matches in the Premier League. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that the high speed train network is not as good as in France. So um, certainly the yeah, there it's are... it's already the case in Italy. Most of the clubs yeah. travel by train. Yeah, and and there are some some examples uh, in Germany. So I think there 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 are a few front runners um, in, in in this field. And um, I, I, for the moment, I think it's about um, using the 
you know, the, sh showing the good examples. And I think with the um, increased interest uh, and awareness of also the, um, the, the spectators uh, and the media in this area, I think it will, it will be sort of a win-win if they start changing their behavior and show that they're, uh, you know, leading in this fight uh, um, against climate change. If you want to have a final word because before we put an end to this round table, I don't know if one of you wants to add something. Maybe I just want to add that IUCN is actually having a Congress in September from the 3rd to the 11th of September. Um, we are organizing an event on sports. I think there are other, actually there are going to be a number of other events organized on sports and biodiversity. The, the Congress was supposed to be two years ago, no, a year and a half ago. At the time, we had an event already organized with the minister, and uh, now we, we, the agenda is still open. But we really hope to bring that conversation in Marseille with the, the local authorities also organizing a lot of activities outdoors. And we hope to create a space where people can have a conversation, think about strategies. I mean, I think this idea of who leads is so important, you know, who gives the good example, who inspires others. And I think, you know, sports, apart from who within sports can lead, but, uh, you know, also how sports can be the leader for other sectors. Um, and in this conversation on climate change, we will all have to make a, an effort. I mean, I was going to say sacrifice because it is <laughs> all going to be a sacrifice. But if we have sports that so many million of people watch every day, doing that, is going to be incredibly in inspiring for everybody as a society. Um, so anyway, I hope Absolutely. to see you all in Marseille um, and definitely you and uh, we'll be in touch for, for that. Thank you so much. If anyone wants to add something before we... Yeah, if I may, one, one course, thing is a, is a quick reaction to one of the questions I saw in the chat which uh -huh. I don't know who it was, but it was, well, it's all well uh, to say everybody has to play a role, but we have to start with the leaders uh, and the decision makers. Mm -hmm. I think it's not either or, it's, 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 it has to take place uh, at the same time. Yeah. So those uh, who are in, in responsible positions in, in sports ministries uh, and sports federations, they have to play their role. But at the same time, I think the, to, to have an impact, it's important that we reach um, also, let's say the, the citizen or the or the outdoor tourists or the outdoor um, sportsmen and women. Having said that, um, I just want to uh, put on the agenda in case uh, you, you haven't heard yet that um, the sport for the European Sport Forum is is on the agenda, eighth and 9th of June, and uh, registration is open. And one of the panels uh, will be, of course, on sustainable sport and we will have an opportunity to discuss those matters further among others with uh, Hans Brownings from the European Environment Agency and uh, hopefully also um, uh, the president of Paris 2024 or his colleague uh, and uh, several other panelists so we hope to hope to see you all at the European Sport Forum which is online of course thank, thank you. you thank you so much good luck Theo good luck Mathieu We'll watch you swim at the Titicaca Lake. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch that, definitely. Thank you so much to all of you. you We're so going to have a look at the sketches from Mara, the drawing of this conversation. Thank you so much. We're going to move shortly to the second round table. Thank you so much to our panelists and the public. Thank you. Thank you.